praise the Lord. We are live. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> praise the Lord. So we are in this study on lessons from David. Lessons from David. And um, I'll tell you. You know, if you want to learn the big lessons in life, you got to be willing to learn the small lessons in life, right? And a lot of Christians, or I don't know if I'd say a lot, but there's some Christians that are focused on big things, you know? Like Jesus made a fish as a man. I want to catch the big one, right? Nobody wants to catch a small little fish. But um, if you don't learn, if you don't perfect catching the smaller fish, you know, when the big fish comes, you're not going to be ready for it. And uh, there's so many lessons we can learn from David, big and small. And, man, we need to humble ourselves and, and learn from those who have gone before us, right? So, praise the Lord. So, uh, let's go ahead and pray, and we'll jump right in here. Father God, thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, God, that your words are spirit and they are life. We thank you that you are awesome in this place, God. We thank you that you reign. We thank you that you're bigger than coronavirus. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord, that your peace rules and reigns in our hearts. God, we thank you that your peace, wherever there is fear, in Jesus' name, we just thank you for peace, for placing that fear right now. In Jesus' name. We thank you that peace is just coming in and displacing that fear within us. And we just thank you for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we're in lesson seven here. Oh, this is a really good one. Overcoming criticism. Overcoming criticism. Um, <clears throat> you are going to be criticized in life, right? And you know, a lot, a lot of people don't like to be criticized. And um, it depends who's doing the criticizing, of course. But a lot of people don't like to be criticized. And then the Bible says that uh, offenses must come. Right? Offenses must come. This is one of those by whom they come, but they are coming. And so you are going to be criticized, you are going to be offended, um, or I should say be tempted to be offended by criticism. And it's important that we uh, learn how to deal you know, with criticism and offense when it comes. So <clears throat> let's go ahead and start here. First Samuel 17, 28. And Eliab, uh, his, talking about David's. Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the naughtiness of your heart, for you are come down, um, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. Right? So uh, a lot of us would you know, we might have some naughtiness in our heart, <laughs> as they said, as the King James Bible puts it. Not in our heart, but now let's keep going here. Here's David standing up to the enemy, operating in faith, and doing nothing but good things that should be admired and praised. Yet when his older brother heard it, he railed on him. Eliab uh, turned on David and began to question why he came, saying, You're irresponsible. You left those few sheep alone in the wilderness. The truth was that he didn't leave them alone. He left them with the keeper. Also, he didn't go down there on his own out of pride. David was submitted to his father who had commanded him. Everything David was doing was exactly right. But it doesn't matter to those who are, you know, cynical and uh, like to criticize. Yeah. Um, man, you could, Jesus was criticized. So you could literally be perfect <laughs> and be criticized. So, you know what? You're going to be criticized whether you do wrong, whether you do right. So you might as well be criticized while you're doing the right thing. Right? Yeah, I mean, you might as well be persecuted for that. Because you're going to be criticized no matter what. So, if you're going to be a giant killer, you need to recognize that criticism will come your way. If you get a different attitude and start operating in faith instead of fear, if you stand up to your giants instead of running from them, if you recognize your covenant rights and privileges and start speaking forth your faith, you will be criticized. And listen, all of us are tempted. You know, all of us are tempted to get in fear. Um... All of us are tempted to, you know, run away from giants. All of us are tempted with that. But we've got to know uh, who's on our side. Praise God. 
So if you decide you aren't going to sit there and bow down to sickness, disease, poverty, oppression, and fear the way everyone else does, there will be people who will turn on you. They will criticize your vision and mock you. It happens every single time. Amen? Um, <laughs> you know, as a Christian, you, it doesn't matter how hard you try, you will never get a natural man to understand spiritual truths. It doesn't matter how hard you try. Um, it is not going to happen. The Bible says in Corinthians, a natural man cannot understand the things of the Spirit. Praise God. Their thinking is revolves around what they can, their five senses, you know, what they can see, hear, feel, smell, and taste. That's their life. And when you, a Christian, try to come in and talk about things that you can't smell or taste or feel or, or see, you know, they, they don't know how to, they don't know what to do with that. But they're natural minded. And uh, God's called us to be spiritually minded, as it says in Romans chapter 8, because to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Yeah. Praise God. When you leave for victory, speak forth your faith and go for it. You condemn, uh, and, and go for it, you condemn the average person's mediocre life. Okay? And it's not like that's your purpose. You're, you know, when you're living for the Lord, and yes, there's going to be persecutions, there's going to be trials, there's going to be tests. There's going to be times when you don't feel like they're victorious. <laughs> you're you're going to feel like, you know, like, uh, like, why does God hate me? <laughs> that, that's not true. God doesn't hate you. But, you know, uh, sometimes you just feel like it's one of those things when it rains, it pours. Kind of. Sometimes it's going to feel like that in your life. That's actually one of the strategies that Satan uses in your life is to overwhelm you. Right? That's one of, the, that's one of his, uh, his strategies. So, uh, when, when you're... Walking by faith, what the Bible tells us to do, and you're speaking your faith, and you know the victory comes, and you're going from faith to faith, from glory to glory, from grace to grace, and God's blessing you, God's hand on you, just like He did to Abraham when Abraham stepped out to obey God in faith. You know, uh, much was added to Abraham in his life. Um, much was added to David. So when these things happen, you know, your your goal is not to make people feel bad about their mediocrity, right? Like how I look at God, you know that's that's pride, that's braggadocious, and and um, man, God can take away everything just as quickly as He did. Praise God! Uh, all good things come from God, is what James chapter one says. So we can't take credit for it and say, "Oh, look at me, I deserve this more than you." No, none of us deserve the grace of God. None of us deserve the goodness, the provision, the healing of God, the forgiveness of God. None of us deserve that. And so that really humbles you and puts you on an even level with everyone else uh, in that regard. So, but nevertheless, when you're going up, and there's other people who are not living for God, they're not walking by faith, even Christians. Christians not walking by faith, they're living a carnal life, you know, just, live, just being naturally minded, and just living that way by, by their five senses. Um, you know, when they're going down and you're going up, they're, they're going to get envious, they're going to get bitter. Praise God, and, and they're going to say, you know, I, I want what you want. I work hard, I do this, I do that. Well, guess what? The blessing of God is not according to how hard you work. It's about obeying God. It's about walking by faith. It's about loving God by your heart, mind, soul, strength. But just like Jesus said, it's about loving people. Amen? It's about putting things into practice in the kingdom of God. It's about, it's about tithing. It's about offering. It's about sowing seed. It's about all, it's so many different things. It's about perseverance. You know what I mean? So it's not about hard work. Praise God. It's about you um, having that pure heart for the Lord. And even if you don't do everything right. Because um, just as I preached on, uh, I think it was two Sundays ago, life is not fair. Life does not reward you for hard work. It just doesn't. There are people who work hard their whole life and they die in poverty. It's true. You know? So the blessing of the Lord is not according to hard work. It's according to the heart. Praise God. Are you humble? Are you following God? Right? So... Uh, okay, let's continue on here. That's the number one reason they criticize and fight against you. If what you're saying about walking in health, prosperity, and joy is true, then they're wrong. If you don't have to be defeated by circumstances, then their excuses are exposed. If you're saying it doesn't matter where you come from, all that matters is where you're going because you can do all things in Christ, then it, then it confronts these people who have been saying, well, I'm a mess because of what my parents did when I was two years old. I was hated in the womb. I wasn't wanted. I'm a victim. Amen? So when you start operating with the victor mentality, you've got all these victim-minded people, and it may be true. Horrible 
the stuff that people have went through. But, but nevertheless, you know, it's up to, your life is up to you. And I think that's one of the most powerful truths that Satan doesn't want Christians to get, is that your life is up to you. You know, God, it doesn't matter if you didn't have parents growing up, or if you did have parents and they weren't good. God says, I am a father to the fatherless. Amen? God can take broken things and he can put them back together and he can bless them and cross them. Praise God. But, you know, a lot of people, it seems like they just want to, they would rather just stay where they're at, not change, and just stay, stay the same, and yet they expect the circumstances to change. And they get upset when they don't. Praise God. So, anyways, God, he says, I've given you the power to get wealth. Satan has beat down humanity for so long that we've honestly forgotten who God created us to be on this earth. Going back to Adam and Eve to multiply, to fill the earth with the glory of God. Satan, through sin, has beat down humanity and our, our mind frames are just so far below what God intended for us to have and to be and to do on this earth. We are his children. We are royal priesthood. Amen? So this is what God is calling us to. He never intended for us to be victims, you know? Um, but anyways, okay, let's, let's continue going on. I don't want to see no say too long. Um, these folks who have been moaning, delegating, and using these things to excuse their ineffective, defeated, and powerless lives are going to be condemned by what you say. They have to do one of two things, either repent and change or criticize. And let me just ask you right now, what's easier to do? To repent and change, to humble yourself, or just to criticize those who are going on? It's easier to criticize. You know? It's easier to sit there in your self-pity and criticize someone else. And, you know, um, we, we just got to guard our hearts. Amen? We got to guard our hearts. And maybe they did grow up with better opportunities. Praise the Lord. Maybe they did. And, <laughs> you know, I'm just using this as an example with um, President Donald Trump. And, you know, I honestly don't care whether you're a Democrat or Republican. Um, you know, that's, I, that has nothing to do with this. But Donald Trump, I see a lot of people criticizing him about the wealth that he's accumulated today. And they say, oh, you know, his dad did this for him and did that for him. And you know what it is? That's a, that's a criticism mentality coming from a victim mentality. Because, yeah, Trump was blessed by his father, but I think it was like $1 million. But he has multiplied that many times over. Amen. What have you done with what is in your hand? I know people are probably getting that right now. What have you done with what's in your hand? Stop criticizing other people. Amen? You will never prosper. You will never step into what God has for you if you have a critical spirit. Rather, we should humble ourselves and, and learn and say, hmm, how did Donald Trump do that? Whether you like the man or not, it's not about that. How did he do that? How did he multiply that? Other successful people, how did they do what they do? How did they think outside the box? You know? You've got you to gotta humble yourself and learn from those who are doing better than you. Praise God. If someone has more money than you, then don't criticize them. Look at them and say, how did they get there? Right? How can we? Because listen, criticizing somebody, that's not going to do anything for you. That's not going to bring you lower, and it's not going to bring you up. All it's going to do is make you feel better about where you're at. That's all it's going to do. Amen? And God has called us to not live like that, because that's, that's what Satan wants us to, he wants us to be critical our whole life, so we can just stay uh, living a mediocre life. Amen? And God does not have that. He, he doesn't desire that for you. He wants you to be blessed. He wants you to be so blessed that all your needs are taken care of. He wants you to be so blessed that you can live in a nicer house. He wants you to be so blessed that you can go on vacations with your family, that you can spend time with your kids and not work yourself to death and miss many important moments in your kids' lives. That's what God has for you. And then he wants you to prosper. And praise God. So, <clears throat> better. let's keep going. So either they'll criticize or they'll say, you know what? I've been wrong. I believe the lie. I can be prosperous, victorious, and healthy too. I'm changing. I'm going to believe God's word. 
So I got this question for you. If what you're doing now is not working for you, why are you going to keep doing it? You know? Praise God. Very few people do this because it requires integrity and taking responsibility for their attitudes and actions. Not many people are willing to do that. Most people will just try to discredit and stop you. Instead of climbing up to your level, they'll just try to pull, down, pull you down to theirs through criticism. And, you know, just to give you a heads up, you're not pulling anybody down through criticism by yourself. Praise God. So, thank you, Lord. It's okay to, to judge things, you know, that are unjust and things like that. That's not what we're talking about, okay? We're talking about people with a victim mentality criticizing those who are living better lives than them. That's what we're talking about. It's okay to call out injustice and things like that, but that's not what we're talking about. So this is why David's oldest brother was so vicious towards him in saying these things. Eliab was there when David was chosen as the next king. The word says that he anointed in the midst of his brethren. Uh, this says that he was anointed in the midst of his brethren. And if you remember, and if you remember Eliab was the first one the prophet Samuel looked at. And in 1 Samuel 16, 6, he looked at Eliab and said, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. Amen. So when Samuel first saw Eliab, he became excited and thought, surely this must be the next king. This must have caused Eliab's hopes to soar, thinking, I'm the oldest and strongest. I'm the toughest and meanest. Who could uh, be king better than me? Then he saw Samuel hear from God and pass over him and all the others in favor of the rest of the family. He had to stand there and honor David with all of his rejected brothers. It's kind of like with Joseph, right? I don't know if you guys remember the story of Joseph, but how Joseph was... His brothers hated him. They were so envious of him because he was favored by his father. But in the end, they all bowed down to him, you know, so because he was second in command of Egypt. But for however long it took for someone to go, uh, it says, it said, I'm sorry, let me read the sentence again. He had to stand there and honor David with all of his rejected brothers. For however long it took for someone to go and fetch him. So Eliab was angry and jealous, thinking, why didn't God choose me, right? Why didn't God choose me? Why didn't God have given me better parents? Why couldn't I have been born in this country, in this state, in this city? Why couldn't, why couldn't my parents have been rich? Why couldn't this? Why couldn't that? Listen, when you, when you ask those questions, why couldn't this? Why couldn't that? You're, you're living in a fairy tale land. You know? And that's exactly what Satan wants you, just going round and round in life, not going anywhere. Praise God. God wants to take you to the land of Canaan. He wants you to stop wandering in the wilderness. But to do that, we've got to listen to God. We've got to humble ourselves. We've got to take responsibility for our lives. We can't control everything that's happened to us, but we can control what kind of person we're going to be. We can control whether we're going to love God, whether we're going to be faithful. We can control those things. Amen? So then, they're on the battlefield with Saul's army. Eliad had just, uh, had been, just like all the other soldiers, hiding from Goliath. He was already in cowardice and fear. And here came his little brother saying, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? So, for those of you guys who have, you know, little brothers or whatnot, uh, or maybe you're the older brother, or I'm sorry, maybe you're the younger brother, um, this must have been really, you know, what do you call it, demasculating for, for him. You know, he, he is the, sh the oldest brother, supposed to be the strongest, right, the protector of the household. I mean, he's the oldest brother, okay? You're, you're supposed to be the protector. And your youngest brother, who's just a 16-year-old, I believe he's about 16, ready boy, <laughs> comes out and says, who is this this, uh, this this giant, right? So I'm sure Eliab felt pretty bad there, but he says, boy, this just got under his skin. It had, it had to have because it forced Eliab either to admit, my youngest brother here is the one who is right. He's a powerful man of God, and I'm a zero, a nothing. Or, or contend, I'm right and he's not. And then impute some kind of wrong to David. See, a victim, a person with a victim mentality, if they can't find something wrong with somebody who's doing better than them, they will try to. They will invent it. They will imagine it. And then it's not what God wants us at. All that effort, all that energy, all, all, that, all that you're expending to criticize someone else and put them down and come up with reasons for why they're, they're better off than you are right now. It's, it's wasted energy. Amen? We could be using that to better ourselves. Uh, and to learn from them. 
This happens all the time in court. When a person testifies and gives a living witness against someone else, nine out of ten times, this is what the lawyer's tactic will be. They won't try to disprove what they're saying or the client. Instead, they'll turn on this witness and try to discredit them. They'll say, this guy's a loser. He's been convicted of perjury. He's done this and that. He doesn't have any character. If they're successful in their effort, then the court just throws his testimony out and all the damage that it, that it could have done is reversed. So this is done on an individual basis as well. When you start talking victory, you know, that God wants me well. I will prosper and succeed. No weapon formed against me will prosper. The person who's living a defeated life has to either repent or condemn you. Amen? You know, the Bible talks about how can two people walk together unless they agree? Not everybody agrees that, that God, I mean, Christians say God is love, but, I mean, do they really believe that? You know? They say God's putting a disease on you, or God, you know, God, um, he's mad at you, and, and these different things, and God's bringing poverty on you because, you know, I don't know, you cussed last week or something. I mean, do we really believe that God is love? Right? And uh, so, unless, unless two people agree, how agree? How can they walk together? Praise God. That's tough right there. We need to get around people who are like-minded, who believe that God loves us, who believe that God wants to prosper us. Amen? So a lot of people will condemn you, which is why, which is why criticism comes. If you get the attitude of David, start basing your evaluation uh, of things on the covenant and get bold enough to speak it, you will be criticized. Praise the Lord. Satan, Satan guarantees it. <laughs> Satan will guarantee that he will bring people in your life and try to bring you down. Because Satan hates us. He hates us. He wants us to starve. He wants us to be in poverty. He wants us to work our fingers to the bone and not have much to show for it. Amen? Satan wants these things for it. He wants us to be limited in life because of a certain disease or sickness. He wants this for us. And if you're out there listening to this, watching this, I want you to know that God loves you, and God wants to break free the chains that have been holding you back from being the child of God that he's called you to be. Amen? For the spirit of the Lord is there is liberty. You don't have to give in to the spirit of fear any longer. The spirit of, the, you know, debilitation uh, from, from Satan. Praise God. God wants to rehabilitate you. God wants to set things straight in your life. He wants to fix relationships. He wants to heal wounds in your life. Praise God. But it's up to you. You've got to open up your heart to Him. You can't be hard, hard-hearted and expect the Lord to move and flow in your life. You've got to humble yourself and say, God, I've lived my life wrong. You've got to repent. Amen? You've got to repent of the way that you've been thinking and living of your evil works. And say, God, here I am. Mold me. You're the potter. I'm the clay. Mold me. Amen? God loves you. Many times this criticism comes through the people who know you the best. Your family. Mm. I, I can hear some of y'all out there right now groaning. <laughs> criticism from your family. After Jesus' own brothers mocked him, he said in Mark 6, 4, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country and among his own kin and in his own house. Praise God. You've got to be careful that you do not exalt uh, your family above the Lord. Amen? You want to be careful that you don't exalt your spouse above the Lord. Praise God. So God, God's got to be number one because you know, there will be times when... Um, your family will push you in the wrong direction. And I'll say, you're not hearing from God. You're not doing this. You know, Job's wife told him to curse God and die. If Job had listened to his wife, he never he would have never got to the end of the book of Job, where Job was blessed with twice as much. And his daughters were beautiful, more beautiful than any other woman in that, you know, in, in that land. Um, so, man, we got to, uh, we, we really got to get things straight in our life and, and, uh, Get our priorities straight, let me just say that. The people who know you the best have a hard time believing that there's really anything special about you because they know you. They know you in the flesh. And, and knowing you in the flesh can blind them to spiritual truths, spiritual things. Praise God. They know where you've been and what you've done. They know your mistakes and your maturity, everything about you. Since they're basing their judgment on outward appearance, it's hard for them to really see 
what God has done in you. I hope you guys are soaking this up right now. Because God has so much for you. And unless you stop paying attention to the criticism, let me just tell you this. If God has called you, who cares? If God has called you and anointed you, who cares what other people think? Amen? Who cares what they say? They don't, they don't line up with, they don't match up with God. If God's anointed you, who are they to say that you're not anointed? Amen? If God's forgiven you, who are they to hold anything against you? Praise God. You need to go on your happy, merry way with the Lord. And that may require you to leave some people and relationships behind, but you've got to do what you've got to do. You, you need to be, you know, the Bible says 1 Corinthians 13, love believes all things. You need to be around people who believe in you. You need to be in people who are pushing in the right direction, not holding you back. Amen? That's God's will for your life. When I first became turned on to the Lord, Andrew Moran says here, some of my family uh, were the very people who said negative things toward me. They didn't do it maliciously. I've always loved my mother, brother, sister, and in-laws, and enjoyed a pretty good relationship with them. But when I first became turned on to the Lord, I just went fanatical. I started believing for miracles and confessing that I could receive the power of God. And some of them were critical of this, not because they hated me, but because they didn't understand me. When they looked at me, I was exactly the same as before. I was telling them that I had had this special encounter with the Lord, and He had spoken to me, but they weren't there. They didn't know what was going on because they were looking on the outward appearance. I'm not saying that all the criticism is mean and malicious or that you can't overcome it. I'm just saying that it's natural. The people who know you the best are still going to consider you as a little brother or neighbor or co-worker or what, whatever it is. He's just talking all of that somewhere. They don't know what God said, and they can't see what's happened on the inside of you. Amen? They need you. If you have a family that perceives spiritual truths, man, you're blessed. But after a period of time, they can't. My family now basically embraces me and approves of what has happened. They know that something happened because it changed my life. Now they see me differently. However, prior to this, it was just my word. They didn't know because they couldn't see what happened on the inside of me. Amen? So, the best thing you can do, <clears throat> excuse me, when it comes to criticism is don't respond to it. You know, you just fuel the fire. Don't, don't try to change people's minds with your words. Don't get shouting matches or arguments. Let people be who they want to be and think the way they want to think. You live your life. Instead of trying to convince someone with your words, um, live it out. Amen? They don't believe in you, so what? God believes in you. Go get around people who do believe in you. And then when they see, because they're, they're just living in natural, obviously, but when they see the anointing at work in your life, then they'll believe. Jesus said, blessed to see you who believes without sin. But there are some people who are so hard-hearted, they can't believe it until they see it. Amen? And God, that's what God has called us to do, is to, to be an example, to show people. Amen? The goodness of God, the power of God, the love of God. So, I'm not trying to throw stones at anyone, but if you're going to become a giant killer, a criticism will come. When you start trying to overcome your problems instead of just sitting down and being overcome by them, when you begin to believe and speak forth your faith instead of just running and hiding like everyone else, you will be challenged. Criticism will come. And sometimes it will be from within your own family. However, you just have to get on with it. You can't let criticism stop you. If criticism can kill a person, and he says, or I'd be dead. Right? It doesn't matter what other people say about you, it's, it's what you say about yourself that counts. And then, this truth is clearly illustrated when Moses sent 12 men to spy out the promised land. Ten of them came back saying it's a good land, but we can't take it because there's giants there. And in Numbers 13, 33, it says we were in our own side as grasshoppers, and so we were in their side. Well, how, how did they know they were like grasshoppers on the other person's side? They didn't talk to anybody. Amen? Sometimes we assume. How the enemy sees us. You know, Satan's scary. Let me just tell you that. Satan's scary. But he doesn't show it. He tries to, he roars like a lion. Right? He's not a lion, but he roars like a lion. And he tries to get you in fear because he knows he doesn't match up with you. Praise God. You have the power of God, you have the spirit of God, 
Amen. You're a child of God. So he tries to be sneaky. <laughs> Praise God. That's the only way he can overcome you. Other people may criticize you because they don't see the way God does. They aren't going to recognize your true power and potential. But it doesn't really matter what other people say. It might be a factor, but it's not the determining factor, or at least it doesn't have to be for you. What really counts is how you see yourself. Do you see yourself as a grasshopper or a giant killer? I know sometimes we feel like a grasshopper. I know sometimes I do. Amen? But that's not what I choose to live out. That's not what I choose to speak out. I don't speak. I may feel like one at times, you know, but I don't talk like one. And I don't portray myself as one. Because as long as the enemy doesn't know how I feel, and I can show him, you know, this, this, is, this is what I, this is who I am, this is what I believe, this is who I believe that I am, the enemy's going to run scared. Just like they tell you, <laughs> I'm not sure how good of an example this is, but just like, you know, they tell you when there's some kind of dangerous predator or animal out there, and if you encounter one in the wilderness, they say try to make yourself as big as possible, right? Spread your arms out, make loud noise, whatnot. Just scare them away. Well, man, you're probably shaking in your boots, feeling scared on the inside. But on the outside, you're trying, you know, you're, you're making yourself big and tall and, and letting this enemy know, you know what, that you're not going to go down without a fight. Praise God. Might not be the smartest thing to do when it comes to a grizzly bear, but. <laughs> but anyways, it's not about how you feel on the inside. It's about how you believe. Amen. And your belief, listen, your belief can differ from how you feel. There's times when I feel a certain way, but that's not what I believe. And so you got to ask yourself, am I going to allow my feeling to override my belief? Or am I going to allow my belief to override my, my feeling? And then, and our belief comes from being rooted and grounded in Christ. This is how I'm going to believe. Amen? So that we've got to decide what, what, which uh, part of us. Our flesh or our spirit? What are we gonna what are we gonna allow to win there? Amen. Thank you, Lord. Um, and, and by the way, a big a big factor in determining what you allow to win, either your belief or your feeling, is what are you speaking? What are you are you gonna speak your feeling or are you gonna speak your belief? Right? We overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of our testimony. Praise God. So he says here, people have mocked, criticized, and railed on me over all kinds of things. They hadn't seen the power of God in my life, and they didn't know what the Lord had spoken to me. But by the grace of God, I've been able to see differently than what people say I know God has touched. Um, I'm sorry, I read this. I've been able to see differently than what people say. I know God has touched my life. I know that he's done something on the inside of me. So it doesn't really matter what other people say about me. What matters is what I say about myself based on what God has spoken to me. This is a tremendous lesson from the life of David. You need to find out who you are. You need to, to discover what God has called you to do. Amen? Then, no matter what criticism you might face, go on in his power and do it. Not your own power. His power. He says, so my good friend Joe Day has made a huge impact on my life. He's the one who actually helped stir, up, stir me up to seek the Lord. Immediately after I became turned on to Jesus, I started receiving criticism from both my family and my church. And you know, I've seen this before too. As, as a pastor, I've seen people, I'm not going to name names, of course, but I've seen people start out well, start coming to church, start really trying to get their life on track, you know? But then some things happen. Some, some you know, maybe persecutions, maybe um, some tough things, maybe they're. they're car broke down, or just some tough thing. Satan will use outside things to, to get to your heart. Understand that. Satan really, what he's fighting for is what's in your heart. And faith comes from the heart. Satan is fighting to destroy your faith in God. Amen? Satan doesn't want you to live the blessed, prosperous life. Satan doesn't want you to go on and help and heal. And so what he'll do is he'll try to use outside things to discourage you. Maybe he'll do a number on your spouse to where she, you know, she or he, 
gets cranky or mean or angry towards you, and he'll try to, try to use your spouse to get to your heart and to get you in restlessness and to get you in, you know, Satan's job. I mean, what he wants to do is he wants to cut off the blessing of God from your life. That's why we need to have faith, but brothers and sisters, we need to have some perseverance in our life. Because the God of this world, Satan, he is going to persecute you. Amen? And I'm not saying there's nothing you can do about it. I'm not saying you just have to sit there and take it like a punching bag. But I am saying that he is going to try to use outside things to discourage you on the inside, to bring you down. And I've seen people just fall by the wayside. They start out one, but they fall by the wayside. Why? Because they allow Satan to get to them. Amen? They get discouraged. And they back off. They back off from seeking God. They back off from doing the right thing. They back off from their relationship with God because they don't want to persevere through those things. But I'll tell you, for those of us who are willing to persevere, for those of us who are willing to push through, I'm telling you, the Bible says that we will have a, 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 the glory, the glory that we will receive, the glory that we will step into is so much better than the perils, the the dangers, the, the trials of this earth. It's worth it. It's worth it. Praise God. So push through the criticism. Amen. The leaders in my church were just reveling me. Due to my fanaticism, one of them wanted to excommunicate me. You know, kick me out of the church. There he is following God. He's going to get kicked out of the church. <laughs> Imagine that. Even though I was still going on with God, all this criticism was beginning to wear on me. So I went to one of Jonah's meetings. Joe called me out in front of everyone and started prophesying. Andrew, I see you like a runner on a track. You're running a race and doing good. And in fact, you're out there leading the pack. But the people in the grandstands are criticizing you. They're yelling at you and telling you that you're doing it all wrong. I see you getting off the track and going up into the grandstands to argue with these spectators. But even if you win the argument, you're going to lose the race. Don't worry about what other people say. Get back on track and finish the race. Do what God has told you to do. That was a powerful word that really ministered to me. I've even given it to other people in the form of a prophecy. If it works for me, I believe it'll work for them. That's a powerful truth. God really spoke to me through that. When you start going for it, Satan raises up people to criticize you. His purpose is to, is to divert you from what you're supposed to do. The devil wants you off track, arguing with spectators in the grandstands, justifying yourself to the other people, and trying to gain the approval of man. However, even if you win the argument, you will still lose the race. You need to get to the place where you don't let criticism change you. Stay on track, and don't let it change your message. That is exactly what David did. After his brother said all these things, he responded in 1 Samuel 17, 29, What have I now done? Is there not a cause? In other words, David said, What are you on my case for? I haven't done anything wrong. In 1 Samuel 17, 30, he says, He turned from him toward another and spake after the same manner. David just turned to the next guy and repeated the same words. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? He didn't let his older brother's criticism slow him down one bit. If you're going to be a giant killer, you have to get, you're going to have to get beyond criticism. If you're going to start overcoming problems and bring deliverance to yourself and others, that's God's will, and others, you're, you're going to have to get to where you aren't so touchy. Who cares what other people have to say about you? Amen? And I believe that, you know, all of us have room uh, to grow in this. Praise God. So David overcame his criticism and continued to speak forth his faith. In 1 Samuel 17, 31 to 32, And when the words were heard which David said, they rehearsed them before Saul. And he sent for him. And David said to Saul, that no man's heart fell because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with his skills. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. God's will is for you to be a light and, and to be a blessing to others. How can we be a blessing to others if we're not blessed ourselves? How can we deliver others if we're not delivered ourselves? Amen? God loves you and he wants to use you in a mighty way. But you have to get rid of that victim mentality because there's going to be people that will criticize you. And, um, man, people who are successful, they don't care about the criticism. You know? I mean, they, they really don't. I don't know if it's like a wall that's built or something. It just, just bounces right off, you know, water off the duck's back. Praise God. So 
that's God's will for us, and I believe that all of us have room, um, have room to uh, to grow in that. I know I definitely do. I'm not going to stand here before you and say, "Oh yeah, it doesn't matter what anybody says. I don't care," you know. And for me, to be honest with you, it's I feel like it's especially difficult for me because I don't know if um, you've looked up the the five love languages. But one of my love languages is words, you know, words of encouragement. And um, so for me, I feel like it's, <laughs> and for those of you out, here, out there who are the same way, you know, that's especially important to you, knowing that people believe in you, that people have your back. And um, so, but nevertheless, you know, we have to grow in this. God created us all different, and there's some things for us that are easy to deal with and other things that are tougher. You know, we're all different. We're all made different, but nevertheless, we have to have this kind of mentality that David had. Amen? Where we just don't allow criticism to stop us um, from pressing forward, to stop us from what we believe. Amen? Don't let people steal your belief. Don't let people steal your confidence. Praise God. And it's not them. It's Satan using them. Because Satan is a thief. He wants to steal your confidence and steal your callings. He, he wants you to push that anointing that God's given you. He wants you to push that down to where nobody can see it or feel it or experience it. Amen? But I'll tell you, God wants you to be a blessing. And he wants you to be free and to be who he made you to be. Amen? Praise God. Father God, I pray for everyone out there, Lord. I just thank you for their, for, uh, their love for you, God. And I thank you, Lord, for your love for them. I thank you, Lord, that your love inspires us to be better, to be greater, God. Our, your love inspires us, God, to go farther. I just thank you, Lord, that, you know, we're not running on fumes here because we're running the, the race of faith. We're running uh, a marathon here. And I just thank you, God, that your love fuels us every step of the way. And there is no lack of of your love. There is such an abundance of your love, God. And I pray for people out there who are discouraged, feeling down. Maybe they've been criticized a lot and put down a lot. I pray, Lord, that they would get a hold of your love and that your love would fuel them to be the best they can be. In Jesus' name. I pray, Lord, that your love would wash away the hatred of everyone who has ever spoken against them. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. You are free in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, that's all we have for tonight. Um, let's go ahead and take up an offering for right now. And uh, if you're watching this, you can, if you, if you desire, you can get online to bclockhart.com. It has bclockhart.com, or you can fill a check or money order to uh, P.O. Box 1399, Lockhart, Texas, 78644. Okay? P.O. Box 1399. So, um, with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and pray over your offering. We appreciate y'all giving, you know, faithfully, and um, the best is yet to come for you. Amen? God, we thank you, Lord, that you give us seed to sow, and I thank you, Father God, that when we are faithful to sow that seed, Lord, you give us more seed, and you give us bread as well to eat, God. We just thank you that you are our provider, and we thank you, Father God, that when you give us seed to sow, it's so that we can receive a bigger harvest to be um for us to be blessed, first of all, but to also be a blessing to those uh, around us, God. So we just thank you so much for being faithful to us, God. And uh, we give because of your faithfulness, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. You are free to give. All right, I'm going to go ahead and end this live video. Uh, we'll see you Sunday. And our church is open for Mother's Day. Praise God. Bring your moms. Uh, we will, you know, there's, we have guidelines in place, and, and you can catch that. We have a pinned post on our Facebook page about the, the eight guidelines that we have for, you know, for opening, such as every other road blocked off and two chairs in between each family, just different things like that. So um, catch that, you know, walk, look at those guidelines and um, make sure that, you know, you're in compliance <laughs> with, uh, with what we got going on here. But we love y'all, and we hope to see y'all. Sunday morning at 9.30 for English, 11 a.m. for Spanish, and Mother, we got gifts for all of y'all, so I hope you can come and we can be a blessing to you. Amen? God bless.